Hi, I'm Wendy Stewart Kaplan. This is my book, She's the Last Model Standing. A tell-all tale about a girl coming to New York in the late 70s, who's me, up until everything that's gone on until now. It's quite a story. So I was born and raised in the Bronx, and I had big dreams, right? My mother had been fifth runner-up in the Miss America pageant. So I grew up with stories about glamour, and we went to a Miss America reunion. She was Miss Connecticut. And I would watch her put on her lipstick in front of the mirror and talk about her days of modeling. And I tell you, from a young age, I was absolutely hooked. And I knew I was destined to do this, right? I had no idea how, right? Because you're growing up in the Bronx, and it's really the furthest thing from the modeling world there. But interestingly enough, I remember being a little kid and saying to my mother, I'm going to go on to be a model just like you, and I'm going to go to Africa. Now, can you imagine those two things? So as part of being a club kid in New York in the late 70s, early 80s, I was a Studio 54 girl. What exactly does that mean? I was at Studio 54 every Thursday and every Sunday. So one of the things you could do was you could hobnob with any of the celebrities back in those days, right? Calvin Klein, any of them, right? But Andy Warhol was there all the time. And he was a bit of an off-putting kind of guy. You know, he didn't talk much, very silent, but everybody knew who Andy was. One of the things that I loved about Studio 54 that me, a kid from the Bronx, could get into the VIP lounge and talk to Andy. Let me tell you something, being in your 20s is big entree into anywhere. So one day, I'm sitting there, I get into the VIP lounge, and Andy Warhol was there, and we just started talking, and people love a new face. People love kids with stories like they're, you know, they're from the Bronx, they've come to Manhattan to pursue their dreams. And as the conversation went on, Andy told me he was doing a film with Joe D'Alessandro. And I, I had no idea who Joe D'Alessandro was. <laughs> I mean, now if I had, what was I thinking, right? And um, he said to me, you know, maybe you'd like to be in the film. And another star who was going to be in the film was called Ultraviolet. These people, for somebody from the Bronx, oh my God, their names were just all crazy to me, right? So we talked and talked, and Andy said to me, I want you to uh, think about it. There's no pay involved, but I could probably give you a painting. Well, to this day, I kick myself because guess what I said? I was like, I was afraid. I was like a little insecure. And I said, no, I'm, I don't think I want to do that. So I never got the painting because if I got the painting, my whole story would have been a lot different. So one of the things I do in my current life, actually for the past 12 years, I make documentary films about endangered people and endangered animals. And I work with non-for-profits to get their story out there. My current documentary that I made with my husband, Alan Kaplan, is called Whisperers and Witnesses, Primate Rescue in Cameroon. So I have to tell you this. At this point, I am a member of the Explorers Club in New York. And for people that don't know that, the Explorers Club has got every single person that they want to explore, right? They want to push the boundaries of land, sea, air, and space. So when I was at the Explorers Club, I met three different women that were rescuing primates in Cameroon. Okay, what exactly does that mean? They were making sure that gorillas and chimpanzees were no longer poached by hunters by building these rescue centers. Not only did they build rescue centers, they went there and employed all the people in the village, having them grow vegetables, bananas, everything to support the rescue centers. And I thought to myself, this is a really great idea for a film. I never bothered to think what Cameroon might be like. So I got in touch with both of these women. One worked for Ape Action Africa, and the other worked for a chimpanzee project, Sanaga Young Chimpanzee Rescue Center. And I told them both I was going to come to Cameroon. I wanted to make a film about them. And they were kind of like, who are you? Well, when I called a week later and told them I had cashed in my frequent flyer miles to go to Cameroon, I guess they realized I was serious. I went to Cameroon, I had to get a letter from each one of them that went to the government saying that I would be there, you know, making this film with my husband. They also told me Cameroon did not have a tourist infrastructure. I never really like gave much thought as to what that meant, right? Because any place I've traveled in the world, I mean, there was always tourism, you would just take that for granted. No tourist infrastructure means one thing, 
that you're guaranteed to have soldiers meet you at the airport, treat you very well, take you anywhere you need to go in a truck. There will be nobody meeting you there with your name on a sign. And there really is nothing set up for tourists. But you know what? I was there to make a film anyway, so it was all good. The other thing about no tourist infrastructure, that translates into no toilet. That's right, no toilet. The second rescue center I was at, that we stayed at, there was just this hole in the ground, right? And I, I kid people, I tell people I was suffering from post PTTD, post-traumatic toilet S syndrome, which means every time you had to go to the bathroom, you really had to think about it. I mean, there were snakes, all kinds of bugs. There was a mosquito that was resistant to the malaria pills that you're taking. So this is some pretty dicey stuff. But as an explorer and a filmmaker, this was something I had to do. And I am the on-camera host in the film. So I'm very excited because this Friday, August 30th, Whispers and Witnesses is going to be at the Woodstock Museum in Saugerties, New York. It's a Woodstock Museum Film Festival. The film is being featured and I will screen the film there as well as do a Q&A. And then, really big news, the film will be at the Golden Door Film Festival, screening on September 22nd. Love the Golden Door Film Festival. Right here in Jersey City, run by the Sorvino family. They're the people that started it. They screen so many independent films there, from documentaries to features, but one of the things that I love about what the Sorvinos are doing, my films support non-for-profits. I always try and feature a non-for-profit in my film. They really highlight autism. That is something that they want to raise the profile on and let everybody know about. And how do they do this? They screen films made by people that have autism, and they just let people know what is going on out there. I think it's so important if we have film as a medium, we let people know that this is a way to call awareness to certain problems in the world. So currently I am shooting Working Dogs, A Love Story. I think I said I like to draw attention to things that people can benefit from or made aware of. 9-11 was a very, very poignant time for me. I think at that point I connected with the dogs that were down at the World Trade Center, the work that they did, how some of them just didn't survive after, how some of them just stayed by the side of their police officer. And it was very intriguing to me that these dogs were serving such a purpose in society. That got the idea started this year about doing a film really you know, paying homage to the, the dogs out there. I call it Working Dogs, A Love Story. And in the film, I'm profiling both service dogs and therapy dogs. So an example of a service dog, I went out uh, with the canine unit in Lafayette, New Jersey, with a wonderful German shepherd that takes down drug dealers and a bloodhound that looks for people that have Alzheimer's. That's something that you might never think about, right? That someone's elderly parent could wander off, that a bloodhound could be used in such a way. The service dogs are un unbelievable. The way they bond with their police officer partner is just a story that needs to be told. I love the relationship. I love showing the relationships, the bonding from the dog to the person and the person to the dog. The therapy dogs are the stories that I could tell you, but I'll share a couple here. I went out with a journalist, a fabulous guy named Jonathan Fox, and he has Dharma the Wonder Dog. Jonathan suffers from epilepsy. Dharma will be able to sense when he is going to have a seizure, and she will remind him, okay, by going like that, by hitting him with her paw, that it's now time to take the medicine to stop the seizure. What I learned from him and Dharma is there are dogs that are specifically trained for scent. For example, uh, the Guiding Eyes Foundation, the Seeing Eye Dog Foundation, unbelievable. The Seeing Eye Dog people, which are located in Morristown, New Jersey, I went to one of their puppy raisers class. These are people just like you or me that take a puppy for a year, usually a golden retriever, a Labrador retriever, it can even be a German Shepherd, and the puppy lives with them for a year and takes classes. Now, why do they do this? Because eventually, at the end of the year, that puppy is going to be given to a person to become their eyes. 
and it's quite a remarkable program. One of the people that I profile in my film, Trish, had just gotten her new dog, her new lab, and the two of them are really kind of getting to know each other, getting to know the ropes. Little things, like things that we would never think of. Her dog can count how many steps it is to the grocery store and then turn and, and walk in. How many steps it is to the bus stop. Her, her life is just like yours or mine, except her life consists of the dependency on this dog and that dog's dependency on her. Dogs, I believe, really, really need to be gratified. They really want to work. So with 9-11 coming up around the corner, I thought it would be really great to mention here, I'm doing a project with a, an organization called Generations, and they are out to bridge the gap between the generations in the LGBTQ community. I have been very involved in LGBTQ rights for, honestly, the last 40 years. It's a very long time. Back in the 80s, I worked with a group called Powers, Pet Owners with AIDS Resource Service. We took care of anyone that had a pet that had HIV or AIDS so that they could keep their pet. We did foster care, veterinary care, litter changing if they needed it. And now I work with a group called Triversity. We service the tri-state area, anywhere from kids coming out all the way up to um, adults transitioning in their 50s, which is a group that really needs attention right now. They have special needs in terms of what their lives are like, you know, when you transition so late in life. So this has been a passion of mine, and I'm lucky enough to be working with this Generations Project. The piece that we're working on for 9-11 is how the LGBTQ community was affected by what happened in 9-11. But it's not a broad-based history. Each person in my group, and I think there's like 15 of us, we will all get up and each one of us will share our own personal story. And I have to tell you, for me personally, this has been one of the toughest things I've, I've ever worked on because, I don't know, in my real life, anybody will tell you I'm like, I'm funny, I'm always the person to make everybody laugh. This has really, really hit me in the gut. It's hard, it's hard to rehash those days of what happened that on 9-11. Well, I'm a member of the Explorers Club, which is a really exciting thing. There's only 3,400 members in the world. Jane Goodall is a member. You know, it is my ability to explore, be insatiable, curiosity, always wanting to lift up the cover and find out what's underneath. And in my case, find out about endangered animals and indigenous people in the world to make films about them. And at any given night, I very excited to tell you this. I can give you a tour of the Explorers Club. We are four and a half, that's right, four and a half stories high, and we have some really great stories about Explorers. I do share the history with you, but more than that, I'm the person that knows every little dicey story. So I encourage you, check out the Explorers Club. Monday nights are our public lectures. You can come, you can get a tour with me on certain nights, and you can hear a really great lex lecture by people from climate change, conservation, doctors, anything that you can hear of, even before it's even broken in the New York Times. So I'd love if you would join me there. So my book, She's the Last Model Standing, Story of My Life, My Tell-All Tale, and I can guarantee you it is a tell-all tale. This book can be found on Amazon. You can order it on Amazon in this copy, or you can do the Kindle version of She's the Last Model Standing. It's, you know what, it's a really funny read. I'm a really funny girl, and I'd like to take you on the trip with me.